One of the coolest rockets of all time is without a doubt the Delta IV Heavy, a triple core monster of a vehicle that literally sets fire to itself when it launches. Check it out in this clip of the Parker Solar Probe launch in 2018, with the beast taking off. But with Vulcan Centaur now entering service, ULA no longer has a need for the Delta IV Heavy, and so we're now staring down the very last of the Delta IV Heavy launches, expected in just a week from now. So I felt like I really should pay homage to the Delta IV Heavy in Kerbal Space Program 2, and I figured it might be fun to do so in my exploration mode playthrough, just to nab a little bit of mission progression at the same time. So I decided to select a couple of outstanding contracts. First off, Keo Stationary Orbit, which requires us to send the spacecraft with a probe core to an orbit of 2,863 kilometers, aka geostationary orbit, aka your orbital speed is the same speed as Kerbin's rotation, therefore making the satellite appear completely stationary from the ground. The other contract we're going to track is the Are There Fuel Stations in Space, which requires us to send an X-264 fuel tank, the biggest one we have currently available, to orbit, along with a docking port. So, my Delta IV Heavy's upper stage will consist of the X-264 fuel tank, along with a probe core and a docking port. But you know, that's kind of boring, so let's take crew as well. Now, although the Delta IV Heavy never flew astronauts, it did carry the Orion spacecraft on its first space journey, complete with a launch escape tower. So we can keep the look of the rocket realistic in that sense, but slightly deviant from the real rocket because, of course, the upper stage fuel tank will be very long, causing the upper stage to be a bit more stretched than the real thing. A compromise that I'm willing to make, however. Other than that small aberration, you know, I think the rocket came out looking pretty true to the real Delta IV Heavy, uh, made especially possible thanks to the fact that in Kerbal Space Program 2 we can paint fuel tanks as well to get this nice white and orange paint scheme, which I think uh, very closely matches the aesthetic of the Delta IV Heavy. I had to build the nose cones for the side boosters myself out of the fairing pieces because right now I haven't unlocked any medium sized nose cones. Uh, so I had to use fairings, basically. And uh, yeah, the other thing I want to mention is it's quite common practice in Kerbal Space Program 1 and Kerbal Space Program 2 to run fuel lines from the side boosters into the central core so that basically during flight only the side boosters are drained of their fuel. Once they're detached, you're left with a completely fully fueled central core. It's a really efficient way of flying. However, it's never been done in real life. It's too complicated. And there's obviously the Delta IV Heavy is no exception. So there's no fuel crossfeed with this rocket. You might have caught it very quickly in the build time lapse, but in case you didn't, I lowered the thrust limiter of the central core engine so that when the two side boosters detach, well, they'll, de they'll run out of fuel first, and then we can carry on a bit longer with just the central core, much like the real Delta IV Heavy. But here we are on the launch pad. Let's launch. Oof, never gets old, the launch aesthetics of Kerbal Space Program 2. Although, sadly, in this case, my Delta IV Heavy did not set fire to itself, much like the real rocket. I'm kind of being a little bit uh, facetious when I say it sets itself on fire. What happens with the Delta IV Heavy is well, you get this big ball of flame shooting up the side of the rocket upon liftoff, but the flame produced uh, isn't actually just the rocket casually setting fire to itself. Rather, it's the visible manifestation of the combustion process. Uh, in KSP and in real life, funnily enough, you need fuel and oxidizer for a rocket. And in the case of Delta IV, that fuel is hydrogen. Now, when the three RS-68 engines are started up, the hydrogen fuel valve opens up before the oxygen valve, essentially meaning that for the first few seconds, liquid hydrogen is just flowing into the engine, but obviously not combusting, and so it just leaves the engine bell. And because hydrogen is lighter than air, it starts to float up the side of the rocket. Now then, a few seconds later, the oxygen flow begins and ignition happens, resulting in the big flame blasting out of the engine bell, which, you know, subsequently ignites all that hydrogen that was floating up the side of the booster, creating the classic Delta IV fireball. And, uh, oh, there we go, the side booster's ready, they've run out of fuel. And there they go. So you see, we've still got uh, fuel in the central core, but obviously it's not fully fuel because, as mentioned, I did not include fuel lines in my Delta IV Heavy uh, replica. I don't want to say recreation because it is, it's is—it's got that stupidly long upper stage just because we needed to fulfill this specific mission in getting that fuel tank into orbit. But that's essentially, you know, the Delta IV Heavy's classic fireball in a nutshell. Uh, and we are going to dearly miss it, you know, although the SLS is a Hydrolox 
fueled rocket, same fuels as the Delta Heavy, that doesn't generate a hydrogen fireball at the side of the rocket because it uses the RS-25 engines, not the RS-68 engines, which, you know, don't do not do that, basically. There's a slightly different ignition sequence for RS-25, which uh, is beyond the scope of this video, <laughs> beyond the scope of this video, really, because look, we are nearly reaching, uh, well, our apoapsis is nearly at the point, the altitude that we need, which, of course, is uh, 2,863 kilometers. It's a, it's a high old orbit, this one, and there goes the first stage there, or the core of the first stage, whatever you want to call it. Uh, now we can fire up our ridiculously big upper stage, as you can see, uh, 4,151 meters per second to simply circularize. It's way overkill. It's only just to fulfill that mission contract and get us some sweet, sweet science. It was actually a pretty significant science reward. Actually. It was like 300 science points, which seems a lot for such well, what I would consider to be a, a fairly trivial mission. But, you know, free science points is science points. I'm going to take what we can get, and, you know, I realize that this video is maybe not quite as epic in scope as my other KSP videos tend to be, or well, I don't want to, like, you know, overhype myself, but to be honest, guys, I've been super busy this week, so today, well, basically, our kitten, he had to have some surgery done, he's fine, he just had to have a minor surgery, so I had to take him to the vet and pick him up, and it was all, so that's kind of been my day today, and yesterday, I was planning on making a big KSP video, but then my uh, my 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 mountain bike riding buddy Dom said, "Hey, do you want to go to this new bike park I've discovered?" And so I said yes. And then so I went mountain biking instead of me. <laughs> so um, so sorry about that. But I'm here. I still managed to make this video for you guys. I hope you enjoy you know what's happening so far. As you can see, we are just initiating the circularization burn to uh, complete the Keo stationary orbit. I don't know if I've got, there's going to be comments below who are like triggered because I described this as a geostationary orbit, even though the term geostationary technically refers to Earth, not Kerbin. Yeah, Kerbin is Earth, come on, you know, it's clearly, it's the fine. Uh, so, just, I'm just, I'm putting this here to cover myself, so when people write their little actually comments below, I've, 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 I've covered, I've covered myself. Anyway, as you can see, we have completed both of our mission objectives. We achieved geostationary orbit, and we've uh, established that, yes, there are fuel stations in space. But we're now going to remove the fuel station from space. We need to get back home. Now, before we do that, I know you guys. Want, I know what you guys want to see. You want to see me pan the camera up like this and time warp and watch as Kerbin doesn't rotate beneath us. We are stationary. We're geostation. We are geostationary. But I forgot to do that. For some reason, I started deorbiting. So I'm going to just quickly reload a quick save. And we can just do this together live. So <laughs> I'm going to switch to live commentary. So here we are in Keo stationary orbit. Let's just uh, time warp so we can see the daylight side. I suppose it doesn't matter because I'm going to do some time warp anyway. So there we are. There's the planet. Let's time warp. And ah, oh, would you look at that? We are stationary relative to the surface and this isn't just like a cool thing you know this is a thing that exists in real life and it has a lot of practical purposes as you might be able to imagine uh, by having a satellite stationary relative to the earth's surface means you can just have a satellite receiver on the ground just pointing at the satellite you know straight up it doesn't need to have to manually adjust itself to account for the fact that the satellite is moving in orbit it's really 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 useful uh, place to uh, put a satellite so um yeah as you can imagine in stationary earth orbit there are a lot of satellites but again we're very very high up so the uh there's a lot of uh, room in geostationary orbit, so there's not really much risk of Kessler syndrome. Okay, I feel like I've now done a decent job. We can turn off the UI, actually. There we are. This is my now showcase of uh, Keo stationary orbit. And then we can crossfade back to the uh, the pre-recorded footage. I'll hand you back over to uh, post-editing uh, Matt. I need to think of a better name than that, really, don't I? Okay, thank you for that brilliant handover live, Matt. Let's get back to where we were on the mission before that uh, kind of intermission just then. Uh, yes, we're forming our deorbit burn to get our periapsis to be within Kerbin's atmosphere so that we can re-enter safely and get Valentina Kerman, Jebediah Kerman, and Tim C. Kerman, who has sadly been cropped off the uh, crew uh, display there in favour of the probe core, apparently was more deserving of having a, 
a little spot just there. Uh, I think one of the things, obviously, there's, there's a lot more things in the KSP2 to, to do list that need to be prioritized, but perhaps in the long run, it might be nice to have Kerbals prioritized over probe cores when it comes to displaying the little face at the top of the screen. Just my two cents anyway. As you can see, we are re-entering at blisteringly high speed because, again, we've come from geostationary or geostationary or whatever you want to call it uh, orbit which is much higher than low carbon orbit but it was it was no match for my uh, my heat shield it held up well no temperature gauges showed up whatsoever and then it's just a case of coasting down through the cloud layer um probably speed the footage up a bit can't we there we are going nice and fast there and uh, when are the parachute's going to deploy i think they're going to deploy in just a second there they go and uh yeah, then we can just time up down to the surface. I feel like I've just sort of... It's a bit redundant me just explaining what's happening on screen because the beauty of video is, of course, a picture says a thousand words. There's 60 pictures per second uh, are happening. So really, you know, I'm spitting 60,000 words every second. That's how overwhelmingly stimulating my videos are. As you can see, in terms of... Um, the, the landing is not the smoothest, I admit, and we've sort of landed inside of a tree, which doesn't look great. I like having a nice little ending shot for when the end cards appear of my ship landed, so I just sort of shuffled it out and rolled it around using SAS until it was placed on a nice... Well, it's not clipped inside a tree now, basically, which uh, looks really nice. And Oh, there's the Kerbals there, looking all nice inside, and yeah... KSB2, oh, it's a beautiful looking game, uh, especially because, you know, this isn't, there's no mods installed here. It's all stock, baby, and there's our beautiful little shop, but we're not going to show the end screen or cut to credits or whatever just yet. We have to, of course, recover the vessel and uh, see what we can unlock in the R&D facility. Uh, there's, uh, oh, yep, press recover. Again, make sure you don't press revert. Uh, that's a bit, I think long term the devs are aware that revert and recover are a bit too close to each other and a bit too, it's a bit too confusing for new players what, what is what. <laughs> uh, so they are going to move them and make it much more clear that if you press revert, everything you just did is lost. <laughs> so, um, yeah, at this point I'd forgotten. I'd already handed the mission so we can go straight to R&D now and take a look at the tech tree. Now we have 420. Nice. Uh, science points remain, which means we can only really lock, unlock one of two nodes. Either the aerial drones node, which gets us some small jet engine parts, and I guess a small wheel. Or oh, there's uh, enhanced coupling. I just wanted to have a quick look at what was in these two nodes here. But I think ultimately between aerial drones and enhanced coupling, enhanced coupling is by far the most useful node to unlock. It's not hugely useful, to be honest. I barely ever use any of the parts there. But tiny and large docking will be very useful. And enhanced coupling is, of course, a necessary thing to unlock in order to get that node available. And that's it. That's the end of the video. You can cut back to that nice beauty shot of our landed Orion stand-in capsule. Uh, well, I show off the names of my Patreons and YouTube channel members who, of course, make all of this content possible. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a shorter video. I know it was a shorter video, but it was a fun video, I think, nonetheless. And sometimes it's nice to get a bit more of a punchy video rather than listen to me drone on for an hour and a half. Uh, but yeah, other than that, great summation of my channel for anyone new here. Don't subscribe because that's how I describe my own content. But if you like the video, then leaving a like down below always helps out. And there's two more videos on screen for my channel that, hey, maybe they do look appealing. Who knows? Thank you.